What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review for Gothic, the cult classic RPG from Piranha Bytes, a German game developer. And I'm excited to cover Gothic because it is one of the most highly requested games on this channel, actually. And I can safely say it's definitely a game that was ahead of its time. But first, a few things to note. Normally, I review games after 100%, but a lot of times with these older titles, they don't really have public metrics to point people to, so I'll just do these regular reviews. Though, that said, in this particular case, I do plan on checking out Gothic 2 and 3, of course, and also Risen. Because one of the reasons Gothic was so requested on the channel is because I cover a ton of CRPGs in general, and the audience had previously pointed me towards Elix. I loved the first Elix. It's definitely very janky and has its problems, but I loved the first one. The second one was a little disappointing, but still pretty good, provided you liked the first one. So naturally, people were very curious about my opinions on the series that Piranha Bytes is most known for, which is Gothic. Though obviously, I'm not going to just leave the middle series out, which is Risen. And it's worth mentioning that most of them will be this more retrospective style review until we get to like Risen 2, as Risen 2 and 3 do have those metrics, so I'll easily be able to do my normal reviews after 100% for those. With all of that said, let's actually start talking a little bit more about Gothic itself. For starters, Gothic is on the older side. This is a 2001 release, and because of that, it really doesn't like modern hardware. But because it is such a beloved classic, there are several workarounds, really. Now, if you get the game off of GOG, it's my understanding it works pretty much out of the gate as they've got a lot of the mods and things installed that are required. But the good news is, even if you're on Steam, it's very easy to get this running because the game has so much love out there. And a couple years ago, when Piranha Bytes was bought up by THQ Nordic, they actually added workshop support to the original title here on Steam, which makes it a very simple thing to just go download the mods you need, which in my case was Union, though depending on your exact hardware setup that could vary a little bit. And furthermore, once you get the game running, you might want to make further adjustments, like say a controller support mod, etc. Because while I am personally much more of a PC guy, which usually means keyboard and mouse, in this particular instance the game has a very strange control scheme, which I think works better with a controller actually, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in terms of the controller support. But that does bring us to our second big point, and that is the controls. Gothic has a very interesting control scheme where a lot of the actions you take require you to press an action button. However, that button on its own won't actually do anything. You'll have to press the action button and then a second key to do things like attack, loot, etc. And furthermore, if you want to actually perform combat, you have to be in a combat stance with your weapons drawn which requires you to press a separate key, and it's initially very clunky. However, I will say that after a couple hours of getting used to it, it feels incredibly natural, actually, which kind of shocked me a little bit, because one thing I wasn't expecting was to get not only used to this, but actually kind of enjoy it. After a few hours in, it just felt very intuitive, and everything kind of clicked, and I was like, oh, I kind of get what they were going for with this control scheme. Though it is worth mentioning that initially it was very off-putting, especially since these days, with digital distribution, we don't exactly get a lot of manuals. Once upon a time, it's my understanding this game came with a manual that explained a little bit of this, but as somebody who reviews games for a living, having to look up how to pick something up off the ground doesn't exactly make you feel very smart. So initially, there's a lot of potential frustration. But now that we've got the game up and running and we understand the controls a little bit, let's talk about the story setup. Though it is worth mentioning that the game has a set difficulty as well as a set character. There's no character creation, you're just some guy who I think's official name is like the nameless hero in terms of the story. Right at the beginning of the game, we find ourselves in a penal colony known as the Valley of Mines. And this penal colony is surrounded by a magical barrier that will allow people in, but not out. Physical goods can travel freely between, but people can't. This is happening because the kingdom is at war with orcs. In order to facilitate this war, the kingdom needs ore, specifically the magical ore from the Valley of Mines. In order to get this, they made it into a penal colony for anyone who breaks any law. You get sent to this colony and you're forced to mine ore. However, to prevent escape, 
escape, they set up the magical barrier, but unfortunately, things went wrong almost immediately. The barrier wound up being much stronger than intended, trapping many of the magicians who made it in there as well, and the confusion caused by this allowed the prisoners to revolt and actually take over. However, they are still, ultimately, stuck inside a barrier that won't let them leave, so they were able to negotiate to where they can still mine ore and trade for outside goods, and as long as they provide ore, the king will provide them the things they need to live and continue mining. However, not everyone in the magical barrier agrees on how to proceed, but we'll talk more about that in just a moment, because we start our journey as one of the prisoners being thrown into this particular penal colony. What you've done, or why, or even if you actually did it, are entirely up to you, but as we're being thrown into the pit, a magician asks us to pass on a letter to another magician inside the barrier, which, for the sake of the story, your character accepts. Though once you're inside the barrier, how you proceed is largely up to you, as the game is relatively open world after that. And while that's how the story starts, it gets much more interesting and involves a lot of faction infighting. But obviously, the big goal is, you know, get out of this penal colony where you're effectively trapped, though the exact way that goes down gets much more interesting than you would probably think, simply because of a relatively subtle and easily missed thing at the beginning. Something went wrong when the mages made the barrier. It overpowered them and got way out of control, and even the magicians aren't really sure why. Well, the why of that winds up being the main story, and it gets remarkably more interesting than it might immediately appear, especially since the game is relatively subtle about it until you're like halfway through the game almost. And beyond that though, the story I think is pretty good. You will ultimately get to choose which faction to join, and we'll talk about them a little later, but I will say that that has relatively little impact on the actual story, with minor differences in the beginning depending on which camp you actually wind up joining although the camp decision does have one much larger effect that you probably won't even realize until late game, which is more about how your character deals with magic. Which brings us to the progression systems. Progression in Gothic 1 is relatively simple, but very meaningful. And it's important to remember that at its core, this game is an RPG. So for starters, each level your character advances costs 500 more experience than the previous one. So you start at level 0, level 1 is going to cost you 500 experience, level 2 is 1,000, 3 is 1,500, etc. And each level you gain is going to give you 10 skill points. Your character has a few stats that all start as low as possible. Now attribute-wise, we have dexterity and strength. Strength is going to increase your prowess with, of course, melee weapons, there are no shields in this game that you can block, and dexterity will increase your damage with bows and ranged weapons. You can also increase your mana, though at the beginning of the game that would be unwise as you won't get magic until much later, or at least a lot of it. All of these can be increased on a one-for-one -one basis, one skill point for one extra point of strength or dexterity, etc. Up to a maximum of a hundred, though even to do that you have to seek out a trainer. You don't just learn anything by leveling up. You have to go find someone who can train you in these things, and each trainer will take those attributes up to a hundred, though that does include any items you're wearing. So if you want to get more training, you need to take off your buff items and get the base attribute up to a hundred. Magic is a little different. Everything else falls under what I would call skills. We have things like lockpicking, stealth, one-handed weapons, two-handed weapons, bows, crossbows, and then a few other ones like acrobatics, which will actually help you jump and move around everything much easier. Though. What I think is most interesting here is actually the weapon skills. Pretty much every skill has two levels in it. However, two-handed weapons is like the continuation of the one-handed skill tree. So it goes levels one and two of one-handed, and then later you can learn levels one of two and two-handed. And the same thing for bows and crossbows, all of which cost an increasing amount of skill points. But what's really cool about this is that your trainer will actually tell you information that changes how you play the game, which I I think is incredibly cool. For instance, you'll start out wielding a one-handed weapon with both hands, and then when you talk to a trainer to get it upgraded, they'll explain how you should actually hold the weapon, and then your character starts using one hand. But if you pay attention, the trainer will even tell you how to make follow-up attacks. 
And this actually translates in game as you watch the animations of your character. If you press the attack button again at the right time, they'll do a whole combo, which can be very effective against enemies, of course, and deal ever increasing amounts of damage as well as throw them off their guard. So in addition to both physically changing how your character's moving, you, the player, can actually sort of perform this rhythm to increase your combos with melee weapons, which is a relatively cool idea. But then, of course, we have magic. Magic isn't really available right away, though it is very strong later provided you can invest into it. Because of this, magic can be a little difficult to make full use of because by the time you get to it, you've probably invested so much in your character that you can't really change what you're doing, which means on a first playthrough especially, you're unlikely to make use of its full potential. And as I was mentioning earlier, which camp you decide to join towards the beginning of the game will decide how quickly you get access to magic. One camp will allow you to use it almost right away, however you will never Never reach the maximum levels if you do this. The main camp, called the Old Camp, will allow you to access magic about halfway through the second act, which is probably your best option if you want to use it. And then there is the New Camp. You will get access to magic from them in about chapter 4. So no matter what happens, you will get access to magic. But in terms of learning it and upgrading your skills, magic is learned in circles. Each circle will give you access to higher tiers of magic. Now when it comes to casting magic, you actually have a couple options here as well. Scrolls or runes. Scrolls are consumable items that are especially useful if your character is not a mage, as spells need to be used in a handful of situations in the game, and everyone will get access access to some teleports later that are basically free to use and kind of act as fast travel. Runes, on the other hand, are more your actual spells. These are the items you use to perform your spells, but they don't get consumed in the process. And using the higher tier ones requires you to know a higher circle of magic. And then the strongest magic you'll actually learn from an NPC that is involved in the main story towards the late game, who can train you even farther. But beyond just that stuff, magic is incredibly versatile in this game. It can do so many things for you. There's all sorts of transformation stuff, there's telekinesis, and a lot of it enables quest solutions that are less obvious. For instance, you can transform into a small bug and go under a lot of gates, which is a valid solution, just as a fun example. There's just a lot of really cool stuff that magic will allow you to do, which I imagine is why they sort of gated it off from the beginning of the game. What I love about the magic system in this game also is this sort of air of mystery, as a lot of it feels very arcane and foreign. And the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of progression before we start talking about more general stuff is the armor system actually. One of the key things that keeps you relatively weak in the beginning is access to armor. Good armor is hard to come by and it is very very important. Depending on which camp you join in the beginning of the game you'll get a different set of armor but unfortunately it all kind of boils down to one clear armor progression towards the end of the game but the initial way you're going to get armor really is by joining a faction. And the second you get armor, you're almost immediately better at combat because it reduces a ton of damage. Though this is done in types as well. Physical, arrows, or magic generally. Sometimes various elements like fire. But armor is very key to your survivability because even with amazing weapons or even ranged attacks, you're very, very squishy in the beginning. Which leads to one of my favorite things about Piranha Bytes games in general, and that is the overall power curve. A lot of everything that I've just mentioned to you really calls culminates as this very interesting progression to power because you start out their game by being very very weak basically everything can kill you but by being careful doing some quests that don't involve combat scrounging what resources you can you slowly become more competent until later on in the game where you become almost a killing machine because where you can barely scratch things at the beginning with old rusted equipment by the time you hit like level 15 20 you are just dominating everything outside of things you clearly should not be fighting to begin with but at least lends itself to this sort of earned power. It makes you enjoy it more because you worked for it. And I think there's something to be said about Piranha Byte's core game design philosophy, which really seems to revolve around that because it's present even in games all the way down to Elix, which is their more recent stuff. And before we move on, I did want to mention that that is probably the coolest thing about playing through Gothic 1 for me, is just seeing how much of their core design philosophy clearly translated to things that they are making now despite this being over 20 years later. 
Now from there, let's talk a little bit about the camps. The camps are cool, but as I mentioned, this is mostly cosmetic. A lot of the story plays out mostly the same way. And I mentioned that because unfortunately, that was one of my complaints about Elix. The factions themselves don't play a terribly important role in the main story. They're involved, but it's very passively. So it's interesting to see that that was the case even in Gothic 1. But the one you're most likely to join on a first playthrough, because it's the one the game kind of pushes you towards, is the old camp. This is the biggest and most stable camp in the penal colony. They are the ones who control the main mine. They mine it for ore. They trade it to the outside world for goods. And they are led by basically a tyrant known as Gomez. Gomez being the overseer of most of the mining operations and therefore the ore, which is being used as currency at this point, largely controls most of the penal colony. A lot of the guards answer to him, though as you might imagine, there's a good bit of corruption to go along with it. Then we have the new camp. The new camp is interesting because it is led by the water water magicians, some of the magicians that are trapped here. However, their goal is not to trade ore to the outside. They have found a new mine that they are mining for ore, but they're using this ore to create an ore mound. Their goal is actually to escape, and their plan is to gather all of this ore into one place and then blow it up, hoping that the magical disruption will tear down the barrier. Because of this, they don't exactly get along with the old camp because they want to keep all of this ore and clearly have very different priorities. It's also worth mentioning that the old camp has the five magicians who enjoy a bit of privilege as well. But as a third option, you have the sect camp. These guys are pretty interesting. They have a camp down in the swamp where they worship an entity known as the Sleeper, which as you might imagine, does come up. These guys use drugs and worship the Sleeper. More specifically though, they're trying to contact the Sleeper through various rituals. And they do this by trying to get visions. One of the ways they'll try to get these visions is by cultivating various plants in the swamp some of which are just straight up drugs. Though I do think it's hilarious that rather than come up with some like special name for them, a lot of times the dialogue will just refer to it as weed, which made me laugh a lot because I was expecting some like, you know, made up fantasy thing and they're just like weed, which is interesting because if you go to the inventory and you have this stuff, it actually does have names that are clearly for like the species it is, I guess. But I got a very good laugh out of all that is my point. But from here, I want to talk a little bit about world building, specifically after we talked about the camps, because as I'm sure you've noticed from the footage, each of these camps has a very distinct visual style. The game itself has a pretty pretty distinct visual style, even with its clunky old graphics. Because what I think Gothic 1 does better than almost anything else is immersion and world building, which is especially interesting because a lot of it is very simple. It's just done very well in a very cohesive way. In many ways, you could argue that none of these systems are particularly deep but they're put together in a way that makes it very easy to get drawn into this world. There's a very clear power curve. Everything has this sort of air of mystery to it, like there's little things you're learning as you go, and this is reflected even in just the training that various people give you. The way you level up, you go from feeling like a nobody to someone who can take on the world quite literally. And while I haven't mentioned up to this point, I really enjoyed the voice acting. It's my understanding that the German version especially is very, very good, but even the English version, I thought it was well done. A lot of the voices and everything are just very memorable. And while it might not be the most technically amazing in terms of like sound, it all sort of just melds together in a way that feels very natural to the world. Even just walking around through the woods has this sort of sinister vibe where danger could be anywhere. And while it's very hard to put my finger on any one thing that really sells this, the package as a whole really does manage to sell it in a way that drew me in much the way that their game Elix drew me in, which I thought was really cool. But from here, let's talk about the combat a little bit. The combat is curious, honestly, because on one hand, I could see it not being everybody's cup of tea. It's one of those things where it hasn't aged particularly gracefully, like most of the games from this era have not. It absolutely feels very clunky, and it definitely takes a while to get used to it, especially given the power curve where you're really not supposed to be fighting a lot of things at the beginning, all of which can lead to a a somewhat off-putting experience when you first get into it. But once you start getting used to the controls, getting some power under your belt, and you start effectively fighting things, it can be a lot of fun, especially with the melee, because there are all sorts of combos and actions you can take in combat. If you get the acrobatic skill, you can even jump and leap around pretty well, and there's a lot of cool stuff to it. And then as I mentioned, the magic system in particular has tons of stuff going for it. Arguably, the most interesting stuff is in the magic tree, which is a shame because, again, it's 
likely to be what you touch the least, especially if you only play through this once. And while I did grow to enjoy what was here, that doesn't really change the fact that combat itself is relatively limited in terms of options. You're basically down to melee, ranged, or magic. You might have some variation in those and exactly how you want to approach things, but ultimately, that's a pretty limited scope. But given the age of the title, not really a big deal in my opinion. And I mentioned it earlier, but to mention it here in the combat section as well, I love the power curve of this game. Going from barely competent to learning things both as a character and as a player that you can exploit, leading to your character just being a murder machine towards the end of the game, is such a fulfilling learning curve. And like a lot of things with this game, I think it unfortunately doesn't really get good until later, which leads to that initial experience probably being the point where a lot of people bounce off of it if I had to guess. But from there, let's talk about Steam Deck compatibility. This being an older title, I was very curious about how it ran on the Steam Deck, and surprisingly, it works very, very well. You're probably going to have to download a lot of the same mods that you do on PC to get it running, but again, this game has seen so much love from the community that a lot of that is readily available. The Steam Workshop support goes a long way, especially if you're playing it just on the Steam Deck, but even if you have it through GOG, you can go to desktop mode, download the Heroic Game Launcher, and still play it that way, though I'm not sure how that experience is, which leads me to one of my main points for the Steam Deck. I tried it in both native Steam mode, and desktop mode. In desktop mode, I could barely get it to work at all, and I'm not really sure why. Which is, unfortunately, why you guys don't see any footage of it, because, and I might show you guys what I was left with, trying to run it in desktop mode where I can actually record did not go very well, and it was a bit of a mess. However, in the native Steam library mode, if you will, it worked perfectly, actually. In fact, there are even controller layouts readily available for the Steam Deck that were made by the community that work perfectly well. And I would argue that the Steam Deck is probably the better experience for this game because the controller support works for this style of control so much better than the PC does. Because on PC, even the controls are relatively simple, but the movements you have to do isn't exactly intuitive. Whereas on a controller, it feels very natural to just hit like the right trigger and then up to, you know, pick things up, attack something, that kind of thing. Whereas the key bindings on the keyboard, it just feels a little bit clunkier. And because of that, I think the Steam Deck, if you want to play this these days, is actually a fantastic option, and it definitely works. At least for the Steam version in particular. I don't exactly know how that's going to work out with GOG, because for GOG, you have to go through desktop mode, which, as I mentioned, just didn't work. But yeah, you can play this on the Steam Deck, and it's arguably the better experience. But that brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we will We'll wrap this thing up. So the positive side of things, I think this game was well ahead of its time. This game came out in 2001. That's before even games like Morrowind had released. The fact that they put out this open world RPG in 2001 with all of this going on is mind blowing to me. It's crazy that I haven't played this. Though to be fair, it was much bigger in Europe than it ever really was here in the US. But what I enjoyed most about this game is that it just had so many cool ideas, even if they weren't fully fleshed out. The idea of the training affecting your character that way and opening up more physical combos that you can do a rhythm with, the power curve itself, the sort of simple progression system that still manages to be incredibly meaningful, just the world building and the atmosphere is all really, really well done. So much so that seeing how much of this game carried over to Elix, which is, you know, also Piranha by its latest game is actually pretty crazy to me. But of course, we do have some negatives. The negatives for this one are honestly very straightforward. The game is quite old. It's very clunky, all of which takes some getting used to. You're going to have to get the game running. There's a lot of mods to install, things to check out that are pretty much required if you want to play it well. And while the game has seen a lot of love that allows it to still be played today, it is ultimately going to take a bit of work on your part to do so, because the age of this game is really the biggest thing holding it back. But I do think it's worth mentioning that if my biggest complaint about a 20-year-old game is that the software hasn't aged well, that's a pretty remarkable feat. But that, combined with the very intentional design choices that can lead to a rough beginning of the game, makes for what is likely a barrier to entry that is frankly just too high for most people, which I think is why Gothic is likely going to continue to be more of a cult classic than anything else. Which brings me to my conclusion. Gothic 1 is a wonderful game, and I can see why it is so beloved 
loved to this day. I think it's an incredible experience. Playing this in 2001 must have been a truly great experience. I can see why this is such a big deal to the people who played it, especially at a young age. In fact, most of my complaints around this title are really centered around this being a first attempt. It's Gothic 1, you know? There are changes that I know were made in Gothic 2 that were well received, and then Gothic 3 everyone seems to not like very much, so I'm curious to see how that's going to pan out. But I'm especially excited for Gothic 2 now because, again, most of my complaints for Gothic 1 were just that the systems themselves could have been fleshed out a little more and they were simple, if nothing else, where they could have been a little deeper. Which leaves me, again, very excited to check out Gothic 2, especially since that's the one most people seem to like the most. I'm also really blown away by how much of the core design philosophy of Gothic made it all the way to Elix. They've obviously added and changed things since then, but a lot of the core ideas are still the same, and I can see why they really do hold up. But to put it simply, while Gothic 1 is far from perfect, it's clunky, it can be janky, in spite of those things, it's damn good, and I'm glad to have played it, and I'm looking forward to playing more in the series. So, with all of that said, I truly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Stick around, we'll be covering the rest of the Gothic series, as well as the Risen series, and I've already covered Elix 1 and 2. So, if you're looking forward to any of that, remember to subscribe. But, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. We just hit 100,000 subscribers recently, and I'm excited to see the channel grow even farther. So thank you, may you wander in wisdom, and have an amazing day.